Um, I am just extraordinarily grateful to be here this evening with 54 attendees so far, and I'm sure that more people will be popping on um, as we continue to move forward. My name is uh, Michelle Whitney. I'm proud to serve this organization as superintendent, and I had a couple teachers email me today and reminded me that it is my superintendent anniversary. It, uh, I officially finished my fourth year as superintendent yesterday. So today is my first day of my fifth year as superintendent. So I've uh, proudly served this organization for a quarter of a century um, and finished four of those as superintendent and couldn't be more thrilled to have worked shoulder to shoulder with amazing people in this community um, doing the heavy lifting of educating the youth of our, our, our nation. And it's uh, an incredible journey and a, just an absolute joy. I've learned a lot in the last four years and I plan to continue to learn right alongside the you, arm in arm, heart to heart as we continue to move forward together. I'm joined here tonight by Susan Sparks. She's our assistant superintendent. Susan um, is not a new face to the organization, but she's in a new spot this year. So we welcome her as she transitions into the assistant superintendent role. Her job is really to oversee all things instructional and social emotional supports. Um, so she's a, a key part of the team. Um, I, we also have tonight Dr. Susana Reyes. She is our assistant superintendent of, in charge of all things operational. Um, so transportation, food service, facilities, community access to buildings, grounds, weeds, sprinklers, like all of it, like your Susanna is in charge of it. Um, we're grateful to have her as part of the team. We also have um, a, a Zoom team supporting us in the background. Mark Garrett has helped us tonight get up and running. Um, and Shane Edinger from our public affairs department will be our, our moderator who will help um, as we move forward here, get people connected um, and their mics unmuted so that you can participate. So I am gonna go ahead and jump right in and share my screen right out of the gate. Um, and I am gonna share a little bit of information with you and then really the majority of our time is going to be spent listening and learning from you about how we do a great job in preparing to reopen for the 2021 school year. So welcome to our town hall meeting. This, this week was a series of three town hall meetings, first ever virtual town hall meetings. So it's been a, an amazing experience and we're just so grateful to have um, the grace and patience and um, being able to take this risk with you as we do a town hall environment in a, in, a, in a complex set of circumstances like we've never seen in an environment like we've never seen. So we're excited to be able to connect to you tonight. First and foremost, we are and have been experiencing a public health crisis and our leadership has really been aligned with four C's, compassion, communication, collaboration, and common sense. It's been very important to us that we lead with compassion. We are trying um, very hard to make sure that we're transparent in our communication. We're collaborating with our key stakeholders and we are really needing to make sense of a world that makes no sense right now and apply common sense the best that we can. We are reopening our schools with a thoughtful balance of returning to in-person edu education and health and safety considerations. We all have our teachers' hearts and we wanna be back face-to-face. -face. Um, I wanna be giving hugs and high fives and handshakes and I don't wanna stand six feet apart from people anymore. <laughs> but the truth is we have to be thoughtful about that our desire to return to normal and balancing that with health and safety considerations. So our goal in this reopening plan is to build in flexibility to meet the needs of those we serve. And we've done some work in engaging our community our, and our employees and staff to really surface needs so that we can be responsive to those. So the purpose, as I stated tonight, is to share a little bit of information with you about state requirements for reopening, some needs that have been identified from collaborator meetings, some survey results that we've collected so far from families, and the bulk of the time will really be spent gathering input and considerations from you to guide our planning efforts and help us build a stronger reopening plan, having heard your voice. There are some things we will not be doing together tonight or a non-purpose. We, we won't spend any time debating or defending the state requirements. The governor has made orders. The office of superintendent has created guidance um, that are really key statutory requirements and mandates for us. And the Washington State Health Department or Department of Health 
has mandated us to follow certain protocols. Um, so we can agree or disagree um, over a cup of coffee once we are um, open and I can hang out with you at Starbucks, but tonight we're not gonna be spending time debating or defending those. We just need to know what they are so that we can plan um, together moving forward. We are not communicating the reopening plan tonight. So if, you, if you're on the call hoping that you would hear the plan, I apologize in advance. Really the truth is we have more questions than answers right now. And so for some of you that might be frustrating, for us it's frustrating. What we want to do is spend this time tonight listening and learning from you and we will continue planning through a variety of collaborative focus groups. We are planning to push another uh, parent survey. So we're gonna continue planning through the month of July with the goal of presenting a draft plan to the school board on July 28th at their regularly scheduled meeting. So I am going to share with you some key requirements and I'm gonna start with those key requirements from OSPI. So OSPI has mandated that we create a school district reopening plan. That reopening plan has come some components and parts that are required for us to plan against and they'll let us know what those are on July 13th. So we are um, very uh, patiently waiting for the key items that will be in that reopening plan, but we're not waiting for them. We are moving forward with those, those pieces of the guidance that we know will be required. So while we're um, anxiously awaiting the template that has all the key components, we're not going to wait. We are going to move forward. We will be required to meet the instructional hours and days requirement under the law. Our school years are required to be 180 days and we have to offer an average of 1,020 hours, 27 instructional hours. In emergency situations, we have been allowed to waive days. Um, like when we had snowpocalypse and snowmageddon, we were allowed to waive days based on that uh, emergency proclamation from the governor. Last spring, we were allowed to waive instructional hours and days. Um, that was a, an anomaly that that can only happen under a certain emergency proclamation that is not in place right now. So we are being required to plan the 2020 2021 school year for 180 days with an average of 1027 instructional hours that could change as the nature of our circumstances change throughout the hour or the year. But right now we're required to plan for 180 days and 1027 instructional hours. We will also be required in 2020-21 to take attendance and to a report our enrollment to OSPI on a monthly basis. Um, those pieces are required of us in our regular operating years. In the spring, we were not required to do that. And, um, but they have been very clear with us that that would be required in the fall. Last spring, OSPI worked with the federal um, education department and was able to waive the federally mandated and state required uh, standardized testing. That waiver is not available through the federal government at this time. Should it become available, Washington State is prepared to apply again to waive the standardized testing in the spring. But at this point, there is no waiver and there is no um, way to anticipate if there will be. So we've been directed to plan as though we will have standardized testing in the spring. You also may remember that OSPI made some emergency rules that, um, in the spring about grading, where they allowed districts some choices, but they also eliminated some choices for district. For example, we were not allowed to give failing grades in the spring under OSPI's emergency rules. Those emergency rules have expired. So as a district, we'll go back to having local control around our grading practices and then um, we can go back to grading students the way that we were prior to the spring. The other piece that we really need to talk about is what is required of us from the Department of Health and under the LNI guidelines. So OSPI's guidance states that for the 2020-2021 school year, school districts should plan to operate with face-to-face in-person instruction following the Department of Health and LNI guidelines. So this chart, chart represents some of the biggest requirements of those guidelines. It is not all of them, but it is a, a high level summary for you. I wanna call your attention to the bottom of the graphic. The very foundation of our public health guidance is around those very strong hygiene practices, which include washing our hands, 
not touching her face. Um, if you sneeze or cough, cover your sneeze or cough and then immediately wash your hands. If soap and water isn't available, you can use hand sanitizer, but as soon as you can wash your hands, wash your hands, wash them for 20 seconds, get in all the crevices, say the happy birthday twice, um, stay home when you're sick. Those are all those really solid hygiene practices that we actually were adhering to and already adhering to in the spring prior to closure. Those become foundationary for us in the 2020-2021 school year, as well as those robust cleaning and disinfecting protocols that we were following in the spring prior to closure. Those become the foundation as we move into the back into reopening schools. Again, increasing uh, cleaning and disinfecting, making sure those high touch surfaces are being regularly wiped down, um, et cetera. So that's the foundation of the department health and labor and industry guidelines. The other pieces are in the columns. The first says a daily health screening. So a requirement by Department of Health is that every employee and every student have a daily health screening. So that's the requirement. There is some flexibility for districts around how they do that requirement. So you may have seen on social media with other um, schools across the state and nation, um, even internationally where students were lined up in front of their, their, their schools and they got new masks and they were sprayed with disinfectant and they took their temperatures. They did that outside of school. So that's one option. We could do on-site health screening. The other option is for parents to answer some health questions at home, take their child's temperature, and then verify through a, a written letter or a signed form or even through like an app notification that their student has been health screened for the day. So we can do on-site or we can do at home. So we have some options in the way that we conduct the health screening, but we have to conduct a daily health screening. The other requirement is around face coverings, and I'll get into that one a little bit um, after this. The third requirement is six feet social distancing. So this requirement really becomes critical around what options we have for opening in the spring. So the guidance says, or in the fall, excuse me, the guidance says that we have to have seating arrangements for students to be seated six feet apart. The guidance recognizes that intermittently students are going to walk past one another and break that six foot barrier. Um, they're not concerned about that because students will also have on a face covering. They recognize that teachers are going to walk up and by the desks and periodically break that six foot barrier. They're not concerned about that. What they want is a seating plan that has six foot social distancing. I will tell you that this guidance is changing rapidly. Um, before I presented on Monday night, there was a potential, or before I presented to the board the last time, there was a potential change around face coverings. That face covering change is now instituted. Today, I've gotten some emails that there's a, a recommendation from the American Association of Pediatrics that is requesting that uh, health guidance uh, regulatory agencies think about a three foot social distancing requirement for especially little kids. So um, if that change is made, that will change what options we have available to us. The other piece, um, so I, I just wanna be really clear, if we have to adhere to the six foot social distancing requirement, um, we can only fit between like 14 and 16 students in a classroom. Our classrooms are about 950 square feet, which sounds like a lot. And on the back of an envelope, it looks like you can fit, you know, 25 kids, 28 kids in there, but and maintain six foot, but in a practicality, you cannot. So if the six foot social distancing requirement is in place, it will mean that we will have to look at our school schedule differently. And it would likely be on some kind of a rotation where part of our kids were in school one day and part of our kids were on in school on another day. The guidance also requires that we think about grouping of students. So this is especially important or actually applies most at the elementary level. So they're wanting us to be thoughtful about students staying together with the same adult most of the time. Um, it doesn't preclude us from kids going to library or specialists, but they do want us to be thoughtful about groups of students staying together. They recognize that at the middle school and high school that that will look different. So middle school and high school students still have the flexibility and latitude to move from class to class. There's also a recognition that students will pass each other in hallways 
um, and, and it would, again, break that six foot barrier. Um, they're not as concerned about that, but they do ask that we think about how we might stagger, pick up, drop off, uh, hallway passing times, et cetera. We will be required to modify large groups, uh, large group activities and high, group, high risk activities. So for example, assemblies, all the students being in the lunchroom at the same time, those are large group activities that we would need to think about and modify. High risk activities are things like football, wrestling, choir, and um, wind instruments. So um, the idea in choir is that students would not be having a mask and they would be singing and it would create uh, an opportunity for particulates and um, exposure, et cetera. Uh, wind instruments, obviously, are blowing into a, uh, an instrument, so there's some concern about that. So those, those activities have been identified by the health department as high risk. So I promised you I would talk about the uh, face covering requirement. This requirement is very, um, I'm going to say, polarizing. People feel very strongly kind of on, one, on either side of the argument. There's people who very, feel very strongly that it's an absolute, it's a must. And there's people who feel very strongly that they shouldn't be required. And then there's people all the way in the middle. We recognize that. We honor people for how they feel about the face covering. We're simply communicating our requirement um, and our obligation to comply with it. So initially, adults were only offered the opportunity of a face covering. And it could have been or a face mask. So it could have been like shown here, the paper or surgical type. It could have been. Um, a cloth face mask. Um, the guidance did change to allow adults to wear a clear plastic face shield, which would allow students to see your face, especially important for those students who use facial cueing as ways to communicate. Also, you know, if you think about our students walking into a building and every adult has their face covered versus walking into our buildings and being able to see the adults they're going to spend time with all day, see their whole face smiling at them that environment would just be so much different for students in a positive way. So um, there was not that flexibility initially in the guidance, but now there is. So adults can choose either a clear plastic face shield or some kind of a face covering, whether it's the surgical mask you see here, or you know, we're, we're all starting to get kind of swanky detail or designer type uh, face masks. I have one that has uh, female superheroes on it that I think is particularly swanky. So um, those are all we meet the face covering requirement. Face shields were always allowed for students. And so um, this picture here shows a, 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 little, a little one with her face shield on, or again, uh, a cloth face covering or the, the surgical masks as, we, as we've seen. So those are the, re, the compliance requirements for face coverings. The current health environment and those key requirements from Department of, Department of Health and LNI are requiring that we think about some re reopening approaches. And I would really like you to think about this slide less as silos, like we're going to pick one or the other, and more as a continuum that we're probably going to move in and out of over the course of the next few months. Um, we, I, I explained that um, the current health guidance, if it requires the six foot social distancing, our buildings do not have enough physical space that would allow us to bring students back all at once and keep them six foot apart. So that requirement is really causing us to look at the spring or the, excuse me, the fall in some kind of on-site face-to-face delivery in a rotation and students then doing something at home when they're not with us. If our current, if our environment, um, for some reason, our local public health or the statewide public health said, you're not allowed to go at school at all, we would then need to be in this at-home learning 2.0 environment. And please be, I, it says at-home learning 2.0 very purposefully. We heard feedback from our, our families and our teachers in the spring about the things that worked really well for them about at-home learning, and they had suggestions about how, would we, how we would improve our at-home learning experience. And please don't hear my saying improve as a criticism of what was in the spring. Our teachers, our principals, our district staff, they took an, a highly personalized in-person 
um, institution like public school and put it online in really about 36 to 72 hours. They did phenomenal work. We learned a lot and we can learn, use what we learned to improve that experience uh, in the fall. Then we may be in a situation where our public health conditions and the requirements from the Department of Health may allow us to all be on campus at the same time in a face-to-face -face service delivery model. It could be that we would still be required to do things like social distance and wear face coverings. And at some point, we will return to what we used to know as a traditional experience where face, face coverings come off, we get to stand next to each other, I'll get to shake your hand and give you that hug. Um, that is a moment that we're all waiting for, but it, it may be a ways off for us. So this is the kind of continuum that we're going to need to be considering over um, one in what approach we'll be using in the fall, but we could be in a situation where we're kind of moving along this continuum over the next few months. We met in collaborator meetings. We had five collaborator meetings that resulted in a 200, over 250 people, staff, parents, and community members participated in uh, four hour long sessions. So it was um, 20 hours of collaboration. And the focus of the meetings, the key purpose of those meetings was to surface, what do the people that we're in service to need from us as we think about those scenarios I just showed you and think about opening school with those scenarios in place. So people were very thoughtful in thinking through what do our students need from us? And it was very clear that our students need clear, consistent guidelines and expectations, and they need policies and procedures in place to keep them safe. They also need social emotional supports. The closure of the school was an unexpected event, which could be traumatizing. They've been home and isolated from their friends and from us for an extended period of time. We need to spend time once we're able to be back together in some form of in-person education, spend time um, really building social emotional supports for our students. Families, they need training on a primary platform. We heard that loud and clear that there were too many different ways of accessing packets and communicating and too many, too, too many different ways of turning things in and they, needed, they need a primary platform and they need to be proactively trained so they know what to expect. Our families need access to devices and reliable internet, and reliable and affordable internet. And if we're in some kind of scenario where we're at home some of the time and on site some of the time, though that our families need support with childcare uh, and or child supervision. So for those days when their students aren't in class, they may need some support with childcare or they may need some support with making sure that their older students are on the same rotation as their younger students so their older students can supervise the younger ones um, on the days when they're at home. Staff, they asked for clear and consistent expectations. They asked also for a selection and training on a primary platform and they asked for us to really think about um, identifying online educational resources. So people were using Imagine Learning and Dreambox and Khan Academy and they wanted us really to explore and um, maximize those online educational resources in a streamlined way to support teachers teaching, families being able to support their students and their students learning. We launched um, a family survey a week or so ago, maybe two weeks ago now. Time starts to run together in this crisis moments. Um, we're getting ready to launch another one. Um, but the results of the family survey, we had about 3,000 responses. The survey was offered in English, Spanish, and Russian. We asked our families to rank order the safety precautions that were being required of us. They wanted, we wanted to know which ones were the most important to them. Um, sanitizing of classrooms and surfaces was number one. Frequent hand washing, um, students not sharing materials, maintaining that social distancing from um, each other in the classroom and providing hand sanitizer. For our families, masks were actually very low on their priority list, yet it is a requirement um, under Department of Health. 90% of our families on that survey said, we're ready to come back to school right now, I will be in the fall, or I'm a little bit nervous, but if you have some minimum things in place for my kiddo, I'm gonna be um, happy to send them back. That changed, however, when we said, if a mask or a face covering is required in the fall, will are you comfortable sending your student back? 
So at that point, 20% of our families said that they were not comfortable sending their, their children back to school if a face covering was required. And the reasons for that kind of varied. Some were, if there's mass required, it's evidence that the community health condition isn't such that I'm willing to send my student back. Um, some, you know, there, some were, um, my child has a health condition that would make me nervous to send them back with a, a face mask. Uh, some were concerned about, you know, will my, my student actually really keep it on? Um, so there was a variety of reasons why, why people were concerned. One of the things that is very important to us as a school district is that in the face of knowing that 20% of our families are feeling uncomfortable about sending their students back based on the face covering requirement, or 10% um, before that we're, we're feeling 10 to 20% of our families are uncomfortable. We want to provide ultimate flexibility for our families to choose another option. We have had since 2013 um, IPAL, which is a K-12 online learning model. In grades K-2, parents get curriculum kits and some support from a certified teacher in delivering that instruction to students in grades K-2. Our grades three through 12 is a total online environment. Core classes are offered. There's limited electives in grades K or six through 12. There are no electives in grade K through five under the IPAL environment. There, again, um, a certified teacher has weekly check-ins and monitors progresses, progress for students in the IPAL program up against their learning plan. And parents then support students um, in this online environment in moving through those um, required lessons. We are also exploring a new K-5 virtual academy. Our plan is to open, uh, based on interest, open this K-5 virtual academy in the fall. This virtual academy would offer the four core classes, math, science, ELA, or English language arts and social studies. It would be an online environment and there would be a more robust elective opportunity that could look like some classes online, but it could also look like some partnership with families and parents in providing some elective opportunities. So that is a new offering. We were planning on um, expanding our online environment even prior to COVID. So this was a great opportunity to partner those two things and meet the needs of our families right now given some um, uncertainty with our families and wanting to send their students back to a physical environment for school in the fall. So I've shared a lot of information with you. We're going to move into your opportunity to provide us insights, ask us questions. Um, and so I'll give you some norms that we're going to ask you to follow for tonight. If you have an issue with a specific school or a staff member, I'm going to ask that you refrain from using this public forum to air that. Um, I, I am, I'm not saying that we don't want to hear it. We absolutely want to help you through any specific concerns at the school level or any specific staff concerns. We're here for you. We want to walk you through and help navigate those and solve any issues that we can. Um, we would just ask that that not happen on the call tonight. I would ask that you write that email down, jrichardson at psd1.org. That is my assistant. You'll email her let her know you need my help in navigating a very specialized concern, and I'll make sure to get you connected and, and get that resolved. If you need support in addressing a very specialized or unique situation, uh, please follow up, follow us up with us either individually after the meeting. Um, I might, I can, depending on timing, be able to stick around a little bit, or also email jrichardson at psd1.org, and I'll get you connected to the right people to help solve those real specialized case-by-case -case situations. And then I'm just gonna ask that you monitor your own airtime. Um, we are gonna have an opportunity for you to ask questions verbally on the call. There's 128 of you on the call, so we wanna make sure that as many of you that want to speak verbally on the call get that opportunity. So we're just gonna ask that you monitor your own airtime and be respectful so that people have the opportunity to, to participate publicly if they would like to. So with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen. Um, and I uh, are, oh, and I'm going to introduce Amy Phillips. Our board member, Amy Phillips, joined us while I was doing my presentation. So thank you, Amy, for being here. Can you wave to the attendees so they can see you? I was here before. I just got on as a parent, and not a panelist, so. Oh, well, welcome. We're sorry about that. You're with the attendees. Thank you. So um, 
the protocol tonight would be if you would like to ask your question verbally, there's a under the reactions on your screen, I think there's a raised hand. Um, raise your hand and our friend um, Shane Edinger will unmute your mic and uh, let you know that it's your turn to ask your questions out loud. Um, we will also be going through the chat kind of when there's time and, and asking some of those questions as well. So with that, Shane, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, well, at this point, we don't have anybody raising their hands. Oh, I spoke too soon. Now they're all raising their hands. No. Good. That's uh, what we want. So first in line is Janice, I believe is how you say that. So Janice, I am unmuting you. So you are now free to talk. Can you hear me now? I can. Okay, Hi. wonderful. Hello. Thanks for having this. So I had a question. How will transportation work? Will that be a limited number of students on the buses? So it's interesting that you ask. Um, so the OSPI guidance talks about um, encouraging students who can ride their bikes, walk, scooters, they should. Encouraging parents that can um, should bring their students. Okay. Those that have to ride the bus should be allowed to ride the bus. The social distancing requirement of six feet does not necessarily apply to the bus. What they ask us to do instead is make sure that students have on a mask or a, a face covering, that we're providing additional ventilation, and that um, we are mindful of the amount of time that students are all on the bus together. So this idea of these health requirements, when you talk about and or when you listen to those that are providing the rationale for those decisions, they talk about them as cumulative. So you have on a mask, that's kind of one, one preventative measure. You social distance, so that's another. Um, so being on the bus, because they're like when you're in a classroom with another student, you're sitting with them for, you know, maybe two to three hours at a time and before a break on a bus, you know, the kids just aren't on the bus for hours and hours. Now we do have some of our kids that are on some extended bus routes, but on those buses, there's fewer kids, so they would be farther apart. So the OSPI guidance um, does specify uh, some things that we need to do. One of the things that I'm concerned about or I'm interested in is then how do we keep our bus drivers safe because they are on the bus the whole time. Right. So it may look like a mask and a face shield for them. Maybe we put up some of those plexiglass barriers that you see at all the places now to provide the bus driver some more comfort um, in knowing that they have some additional layers of precaution. Um, so lots of details to be worked out with our transportation staff. We have some focus groups coming up July 13th through the 17th and our experts, our transportation experts will take that guidance as written by the Department of Health and think about how are we really gonna operationalize that for our bus drivers. So we're gonna get that guidance into our experts' hands and let them dig into it and let us know what they need from us in order to feel comfortable and confident with students on the bus. Okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you, okay. thanks for being here. Um, Priscilla and Raul, you are next. So it's not really a question, more so a comment. And I know there's so many factors that come into play. Um, as a parent, I really like the rotational schedule so that there's some distancing, uh, but there's still that one-on-one um, -on -one FaceTime. But what I would really like to see that I kind of I wish had been done a little bit more in the spring was that the teachers were doing Zoom sessions so that even when the kids are at home, if it's their day at home rather than in school, they're still listening to the teacher's instructions. Even if it's not completely interactive, that they're still kind of in the classroom setting and listening to the instructions given by the teachers. And that way there's this kind of consistency in their attending school every day as they normally would. So I guess that's just a, a comment preference for me as a parent. 
No, that's great. And that's exactly why we're here. We love to hear those kinds of suggestions from you as parents. And I will tell you, um, having set in in a lot of different environments where we've been talking about what we need to, how things need to look different in the, in the fall, um, that's a pretty consistent request um, by parents. So we appreciate you bringing it to us and reinforcing the need for that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, had a question in the chat that was actually asked a couple of times, so I thought we'd ask it here. Um, are the reopening approaches linked to the phases of opening for Washington State? For example, if we're only allowed, if we're still in phase one, will we be forced to be uh, at, at home learning the whole time? So it's a great question and it's one I asked too when I got the guidance. So the, it is not directly connected. So in the guidance, there's a reference to at phase two, um, you know, X, Y, and Z happens, mm -hmm. but we would be allowed with um, the approval of our local health department to open schools in phase one or 1.5. Um, and the local department would have the authority to apply additional restrictions to the school district. And I actually just had a conversation right before I came here with our local health department representative. Um, mo we, we have to follow the guidance in the OSPI uh, guidelines. And um, the only additional requirement they would have is that we have a, what they would call an outbreak plan. So if someone contracted COVID, like what would we do? And actually that they would tell us what our outbreak plan is. So that would be the only additional requirement we would have to have in place in order to open in phase one or 1.5. Now I wanna preface all of tonight with, that is what I know right now at 6.36 PM. The landscape around all of this shifts so quickly that that could be different by tomorrow at this time. So that's what I know right now, that we would be given the option to open um, with the OSPI guidelines in place, with the additional um, information around an outbreak plan. Our, our plan would then go to OSPI and our local Department of Health uh, for approval to open in the fall. But it's a good question. I think I'm going to just editorially my, my personal opinion. I expected the guidance to be aligned with the phases. And when it wasn't, I was surprised. And it took me a little bit to kind of figure out. It, I, I just wasn't expecting that. It was unexpected. So it has taken, I think, some superintendents across the state a little bit to try to kind of get our heads around what does that really mean. So it's a great question. OK, uh, Josh has been waiting patiently with his hand raised. So now, Josh, is your turn to speak. Hi, Josh. I think we can hear you now, Josh. All right. One more time, Josh. Going once, going twice. Um, all right, how about a question from the chat? Uh, considering parent concerns about students sharing supplies, uh, Laura says that she didn't see any OSPI guidance regarding sharing supplies. Is there a policy regarding this? Uh, she says, I'm thinking especially in specials because she teaches art. Yeah, so on the slide that I shared was just some of the big highlights, but it, that is actually in the guidance that they, they talk about um, thinking about how to limit sharing of supplies. They don't specifically tell you how they want you to do that, but they do ask that you think about limiting the sharing of supplies. Um, so again, as we look at those focus groups through the 13th and the 17th, that's, um, that's one of the things that we need to talk about is how would we do that? How would we support teachers with that? Recognizing that it would create the need for additional supplies and fully rec recognizing our obligation as a district to, to support that. Okay, uh, Lane has a question. Lane, go ahead and ask your question. Good evening, Ms. Whitney. Thanks for holding these forums. Um, I have a question as I'm looking at and thinking about that continuum <clears throat> that you've presented, where one of the options is basically that we return entirely face-to-face -face without a virtual or online component, but possibly 
with an altered schedule or some kind of a rotational schedule. And as I think of that type of a model, I, I'm caused to wonder, can that, can that really be done without subjecting our students to um, some type of a significant inconvenience or strain, meaning they have to go to school a significant you know, amount of time earlier than normal or uh, be in school much later in the day than normal? It seems to me that, that um, it would be more easily done with a mixed com uh, approach of um, in-face and virtual learning. Yeah, so let me clarify and then see if I can help kind of navigate your question. So in order to be in face-to-face -face instruction, we would all have to be able to be in the same building together all day long. So it would be a traditional, like students would show up at the beginning of the day, they would be there all day and every student would be there and they would be getting all of their instruction during a regular instructional day. Absent that, we would be in some kind of a rotation where they were getting some of their instruction at school and then some of their instruction at home. So it wouldn't, we wouldn't be in a, a like the only way that we're in a full face-to-face -face is if every kid can come to school every day. Does that help at all? Yes, absolutely. I, I had it in mind that we'd somehow have a, new rotational face-to-face -face, but on a significantly modified yes that does answer my question thank you yes no happy to help okay um let's see here we have steve steve simmons you're it's your turn to ask a question you hear me Yes, try one more time. You might need to get a little closer to your microphone. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we, I had a couple questions. Um, one would be, I didn't, I don't remember if there was anything in the um, guidelines that said anything about sports. I don't know if that's going to be something we're going to be uh, considering this year. Also with uh, activities in school like band uh, in a face-to-face -face situation, what, what is the, our um, thought there? And then um, with people that have asthma and underlying health conditions, um, well, I guess stuff like asthma, how is, and exemptions, how is that going to play out in a face-to-face -face environment? Sure. So sports, um, WIAA has some guidance on their website and uh, we'll be creating a frequently asked questions document uh, after this town hall meeting and it'll be on posted on our website and I'll make sure the link to the WIAA guidance is there. Um, and they have some guidelines, for example, the modifications we would need to make to each sport in order to, to, to be in compliance. That guidance is attached to phases, and I, I believe that it, it's in order to, to, for sports to start, you have to be in phase two. Um, we would continue to work with our local health department to really understand what that all means, but WIAA does have guidance that we um, are to follow. And I've mentioned a couple of times, and I'll mention it multiple times throughout the call tonight, that the focus groups that we're having through July 13th through the 17th are opportunities for those specialized groups of employees and parents and those that are interested to get together around key questions like that. So there'll be a group of people who are looking at that WIAA guidance. Um, so that's the about sports. You asked about band. That also is going to be tackled in a focus group, recognizing that it's listed as a high risk activity. OSPI also has suggestions about how we might modify a banned classroom in order to have it be less high risk. For example, some of the, and I'm not saying these are necessarily good ideas or bad ideas. I'm just telling you, this is what OSBI is saying that for example, like when the weather's good, can kids go outside to practice band? Um, you know, can they be in the largest area of the school as far as part as they can get while they practice their instrument? So because they're blowing into an instrument, you would increase the social distancing to try to decrease the amount of, of contagion. Um, so those are the kinds of things that, that OSPI is talking about as they talk about modifying large events and some of those at-risk or high-risk activities. 
So um, again, our band and music teachers will be a focus group that will help us make sense of that and see what's feasible. And what's feasible at one school might look slightly different at another school, but we're committed to continuing to offer those opportunities for students because we recognize that those are really important to our community and our, and our, and our students. You asked also then about students who have underlying health conditions. Um, we would need to work individually with families to accommodate um, students with individual health conditions. And, um, you know, we do some of that on a regular, during regular operations, students, student breaks a leg, we accommodate, you know, student needs to take his, their inhaler before a PE class, we support them in doing that. This is a larger scale um, and a, a kind of a bigger impact. So we would be working with families individual. I just briefly saw pop by the chat, you know, students who are, you know, are battling cancer are, you know, there's big illnesses that are happening with our student population all the time. So we would need to work really closely with those families and make sure that we can accommodate. Did I get all your questions, Mr. Simmons? Yeah. Um, I know someone here in the chat had also said, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, there are many staff which cannot or students that cannot wear any face coverings. So that that was kind of like that was kind of along the lines of my question there. Yeah. So staff is another piece. I'll, I'll talk about staff for a second and then I can circle back around to your question about what do we do if if they can't wear a face covering. So staff is, you know, we have staff that are in the at risk category. So um, we we also accommodate for health conditions during regular operations as well. So we have a process for that for staff. We would utilize that same process to accommodate under the COVID conditions um, for staff. And you know, the accommodations for staff might be a modified work assignment, you know, things like that. So we would work individually with our, our human resources and employee services team is really practiced at that. They're experts at it. Um, we learned a lot from the spring about how our process worked. Some of it worked really great. Some there were pieces that that didn't work great. So we've been able to modify some of that in preparation for the fall, knowing that some of our staff is going to need accommodations. Your question about because the face covering requirement does have some very specific exceptions for people who have certain medical conditions or behavior um, conditions or people who need to see or need to, to use their own facial expressions as a form of communication. So the question is, well, if they, they can't wear a face mask, what are the options for them? And, and, the, answer, and I, the, the truth of that is I'm not sure, but we have a public health team that um, is working on making sense of that, those guidance. And I think that there needs to be really some thoughtful consideration to making sure people aren't excluded from opportunities because they have a disability, but also making sure that we're, we're able to keep them safe and others safe. So they'll just need to be some, like we need to learn more about that and exactly what it is that we can do um, in order to provide people access and not be penalizing someone because they have a disability and then also making sure that we're adhering to the guidance. So um, it's a great question and one that we just don't know the answer to yet, but we absolutely will get it um, dialed in before school starts. Okay, um, thank you, Steve. Uh, had a couple of folks ask about recess and what will happen with recess? Will they be able to play outside? Uh, will students be able to interact with one another or will they be expected to play alone? Uh, just worrying about the social development, especially in younger kids. Yeah, no, we're all worried about the social development in, in our young, in all of us really, but our younger kids in particular. You know, that's where that three foot social distancing um, recommendation from the American Pediatrics Association will be really important. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens with that between now and the start of school. Um, there's a part of me who, if we can keep people safe and allow that three foot distance, sure would like to see that happen. Um, so as far as recess, yes, they can be at recess. I'm pressing really hard with anyone who will listen to me that students not be required to wear a face covering outside. They, they will still be required to social distance in a way that makes sense. We also learned there was some real concern real early on in the pandemic about our playground equipment and what needed to happen in terms of disinfecting and how do you manage all of that. Um, there's some clear guidance about uh, requirement to disinfect weekly, but because it's outside in the sun and they're, they're not as concerned about that. So 
Um, you know, we should see kids outside playing. They may be a little farther apart from each other than we're used to seeing, but they should be able to, you know, utilize the playground equipment uh, in a reasonable way, you know, play with a jump rope, you know, a hula hoop ball, that sort of thing. Um, and like I said, I'm really advocating with anyone who will listen that they be allowed to not wear any kind of a face covering outside. Um, so that is the, the, I think I got your question about recess, Shane. Was there another part to that? Um, no, I think you covered pretty much everything that was part of that question. Um, Nick has been raising his hand. Nick, ask, please ask your question. Hi, yes, um, this is actually his wife, but oh. <laughs> my question, and I, I feel like you have already put slides up and I'm sorry that I don't understand it as well as I should, but my concern is that since we're getting a plan, if you will, call it that laid out right before school starts, and like you had those different phases that will be flowing in and out of those, if come you know a week before school starts, I'm not comfortable with the plan, uh, going forward and sending my kids to school, is it too late for me to have an option of going somewhere else to find a virtual plan to stay at home or is that something that will be offered to me? Sure, so in terms of timing, so let's, let's set aside some last minute community health change. So just regular process, we'll have a plan, a draft of the plan to the school board by the end of June or July, July 28th. So by July 28th, you should have a pretty good idea as a family where we're headed. Um, the board will then approve it. Um, well, they'll give us input feedback. We'll bring it back to them for approval on August 11th. So for sure by August 11th, we'll, ha we'll have a plan because I have to have it on file with OSPI two weeks prior to school starting. Now that all being so, and so again, absent some kind of thing we didn't expect, like all of a sudden there's a huge spike and, you know, the governor tells us we have to all stay home again and close all the schools, you know, that would give you kind of like 15 days before school starts. That being said, we want to make ultimate flexibility for parents. We recognize this is an uncertain time. We recognize that things will shift and change. Like maybe you start your kids in school thinking that you're gonna feel comfortable and then all of a sudden you don't feel comfortable anymore and you wanna to go to a virtual environment. So I guess what I would really like to do is build our plan that doesn't have these hard rigid guidelines or deadlines. Like if you don't tell us by August 15th, then you don't have the option. I just don't think in this environment of uncertainty that that is accommodating for families. Now that desire to have the ultimate flexibility will also have to be balanced with staffing needs and so forth. But know that the eye we're gonna have on the plan is to build in ultimate flexibility for you as a family to be able to be nimble and agile in your decision-making based on the circumstances of what's happening. So I don't wanna create arbitrary cutoffs and deadlines that create hardship for you as a family. So that will be the ultimate goal as we build the plan. Yes, I, I, I appreciate that. Um, I love that you're focusing on the family's needs. I just know I would prefer my kids to stay in Pasco School District, but I just want to give, I mean, if having a virtual option is, if, if going virtually is not an option, then I need to start looking elsewhere for my kids. So we, ha we will have a virtual option in IPAL, and we will have a virtual option in the K-5 Virtual Academy. And if okay. you as a Pasco School District family want to take advantage of that, um, Deb Thurston, D Thurston, T H U R S T O N at PSD1.org. Email her tonight and let her know you're interested. And, and um, she'll start. Someone put the, oh, is Deb's on the call? Deb put her email in the chat. So her email is there. Um, so, like I said, if you're a Pasco family and you want to take advantage of that, then that, we're, we're not going to say it's full, like you don't have any options. Thank you so much. Yes, and I would really highly recommend you reach out to Deb via email. The other email to know is it's just ipal, I-P-A-L, at psd1.org. That's another one you can email, and Deb and her team is phenomenal. They'll get you the information that you need. They'll answer the questions that you have. Um, they're pretty amazing, and Deb's putting her phone number in the chat, too, 546-2810. Thank you so much. Yes, absolutely. I'm... I'm really proud of our IPAL program and this has just been a phenomenal opportunity to do the work we wanted to do anyway in partnership with our family in a time when 
families need that flexibility even more than ever. So we're proud of that work and Deb and her team have been doing a phenomenal job. Okay, Cisco is next in line. Cisco. Can you hear me? Oh. Hi. Yes. Oh, sorry. I'm his wife, but using his account, I'm Heather. Hi. <laughs> That's okay. Heather? Well, hello, Heather. <laughs> Hi. Um, so my assumption is that because they will be going, it sounds like every other day, does that mean like a Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday version? What happens to a Friday? And in addition to that, would that be like extra time possibly for kids with IEPs or how do we fulfill those requirements for kids with IEPs? So all those are great questions questions. There's going to be a survey that's pushed out within the next day or so, or maybe the beginning of next week. Shane, the timing on that? Uh, the survey will go out next week. Um, information about the uh, information about being uh, part of the focus groups, that will go out tomorrow. Okay, so there will be a survey that pushes on Monday of next week that will outline um, so your question is, well, what are the days and how does that work? There'll be a, a question there where you can select as a family what your preference would be. So we're surveying families around that. So the answer to the question is we're not sure yet. We're still working with families um, and the focus groups will happen the 13th through the 17th. So we're going to be working with and collaborating with our stakeholders during that week. So we're just not sure exactly what the rotation will look like because we want to get more feedback. So be looking for that survey opportunity if you have strong feelings about that. Um, and like uh, Shane said, that will go out on Monday. And then you asked me another question about IEP students. So yes, we, we in the development of the plan, we wanna be really thoughtful about the students who have the highest need, making sure that they have access to um, additional supports, fully recognizing that we have some obligations under IEPs and 504s. Um, and that was feedback that we heard from our spring about where we could do a better job in supporting um, students with IEPs and 504s. So we want to be really thoughtful about how that looks. And again, there is a focus group specific around the needs of our special education population. Um, so Shane referenced um, a, a survey that will be going out tomorrow or some information that will be going out tomorrow that lists all the different focus groups that we are going to have. And it asks if you're interested in participating and it gives you a place to email. So watch for that going out. And if you're interested in participating in one of those focus groups, you just uh, click the link and it actually will go to my assistant and she'll make sure that you get connected to the focus group that you wanna participate in. Okay, thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, and then would, do you know, would we have some say in what days our children go? So let's say if it was a Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday, and I had two kids, could they alternate so that way I could focus on one kid at home during the week instead of two? So you know what, that's interesting. I think, see, this is why I love these forums. Like as a, I think as a district, we were thinking that you would want your kids all in the same rotation. <laughs> so that's <laughs> kind of um, you know, yes, we want to build in that flexibility. What might happen is you may out of the gate get assigned to a day, but we would then give parents the, the flexibility to like call us and say, hey, can you move me to a, a different rotation? And then we would be making those accommodations. Um, so we do, it, it's likely that you're going to get assigned just out of the gate, just so that we can get all the information like in the computers and databases but we're already thinking about how we build flexibility for families who want to make those specialized requests and then adjust. So yes, absolutely. We just had that conversation on Monday about how incredibly important that would be for families to be able to have some flexibility. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, Delena has a question. Delena, go ahead. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I just have a question about how you guys are going to handle lunches. Are they going to be rotational as well? I'm kind of worried that my son will not be hungry in the morning because of his medication and then might be hungry later, but he's already had his lunch rotation. Or are they mm -hmm. going to be in their classrooms? How are we going to handle masks with lunch? Yep. We have talked about it a lot. Um, there's been no definitive decisions made. There's lots of options. And you're going to get sick of me saying this, but there's a focus group that's going to focus on that. 
Um, and, and again, we've talked about a ton of different things, you know, bringing them in small groups in the cafeteria. Do we take, you know, grab and go to the classroom? You know, if we do that, how do we make sure that everybody, all the employees get their lunches, so on and so forth. So there's lots of details to work out. What, what we want to make sure that you know as a parent is we recognize, we fully recognize that it's important that kids have the opportunity to eat at school. And for the days when your students aren't at school, if we're on a rotation, we want to make sure that you're aware that we would be making sure that students had access to food for all of the days, even the days that they weren't wrote, like at, at school. So lunch is going to be complicated, um, but we want to make sure that our, our students' needs are met for sure. Okay, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> you bet. You bet. Sorry, muted myself. Uh, Bill is next in line. Bill, go ahead. Hi, Bill. Bill, if you can hear us, please unmute your microphone. He looks muted to me still, Shane. Yeah, I'm trying to unmute him, but the, I th when I sent the message, it says the host would like okay, you to unmute. Muted. Hey, Bill, now we on. can hear you. There we go. I, I actually didn't mean to hit it, so um, you're doing oh. a great job. I'm enjoying listening, but no hey, question. Is, okay. Is that Mr. Stillwell? It is. Hi, how are you? I recognize your voice. I'm good. I'm good. I'm just just interested to see how this is all going to work out. <laughs> well, good evening. Glad you're here. All right. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Tara is next in line. Tara. Hello. Hi there. Hi. Um, so first of all, Ms. Whitney, thank you for having this for the parents so that we can all um, kind of be involved in, and engage in this. Um, I just had two, two questions. Um, so the first one is kind of in relation to the lunch issue that you were just discussing. And have you guys considered um, doing something like a half day model where rather than the staggered the Monday, Wednesday, and the Tuesday, Thursday, where you do like half days for some students and then everybody's kind of gone at lunch so that, you know, you don't have everybody transitioning at the same time. And then, you know, like, I don't know, say like an eight to 11 and then a noon to three type of schedule for kids. Is that something that you guys have considered rather than the, you know, full days, then that kind of gets you out of the lunch thing, then people are eating at home. Um, maybe that could, could help. Yeah, we, you know, we talked about that. The, the complexity of it is you have a whole group of students that leave. You would basically have to sanitize the building in between in order and then to bring the students back. So the, the Department of Health guidelines around cleaning would require that we cleaned the building, um, sanitize the whole building before we brought in another group of students. So it's just a little more complicated. Um, it's not to say it's not impossible. So we have talked about it. Um, and again, no definitive decision has been made on the rotations. Um, there's also the transportation uh, piece of that is complicated because could we get our buses, get kids picked up, dropped off, a, a group taken home and another group dropped off in a timely enough manner to where, you know, your school day wasn't extending out beyond, you know, from eight in the morning to eight at night. So there's just some complexity around the, the half day, half day, um, but we absolutely are thinking about it. Okay, and then um, the other question I had is just in regards for um, when both parents are working outside the home, how and you have younger, younger kids, like kindergarten, first graders, how, how do you manage, like that's been a real challenge for us with, with online learning and trying to figure out um, how we can balance our son's needs with, with our own professional requirements that we have. And so that's just, a, that's a really big challenge. Um, if you have a parent that's at home that can take on that, that online learning component, um, I think it's a, maybe a little bit easier. And I know everybody's dealing with their own challenges right now, but is, is that something you guys have considered as well? Oh, it, we, it comes up every time we have a collaborator meeting, every time we have a discussion. And, um, you know, I've talked to many parents over the summer. Um, you know, I've cried with parents on the phone over the summer about the complexity of what you guys are dealing with. And 
So yes, it's absolutely on our mind. We'll do as much as we can to support you. Um, parents, teachers bring it up on parents' behalf, parents bring it up on other parents' behalf. And so, you know, it is, it is on our minds. Um, it's one of the, the pieces around, you know, really leaning in with our local partners who could provide childcare. As a district, we would not be providing childcare, but by partnering, you know, can we partner with Boys and Girls Club or some of those places to offer childcare for parents that don't typically take advantage of childcare? I mean, that's been part of the discussion. So we definitely have you on our hearts as we're making these um, plans. And, and there's lots of people who are voicing on your behalf at, in these collaborative groups. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thanks for being here. Okay, um, so we tried to call on Josh earlier and his microphone wasn't working. Uh, he did put his question in the chat. Okay. So I thought I would say I would give him, and it looks like he's still on the call. So yeah. Josh asks, what conditions or what considerations will there be for two-way dual language classes to ensure the children have constant communication and build their language skills? Specifically for kindergarten, will there be more Spanish online programs available? Yeah, it's a great question and, and one that we, um, we recognize from the spring that we need to tackle and it is one of the focus groups. So if you have a particular interest and can uh, participate in that focus group, we would love to have you. Uh, we recognize that we have some work to do around our two-way dual language uh, if it's going to remain online or in this environment as a, as a longer term than what we had initially anticipated. So I don't have answers to your questions, but I definitely want you to know that those questions are on the right people's minds and there's a group of people who are gonna meet and dig into that. Okay, uh, Mindy, Mindy Gardner has the next question. Hi, Mindy Gardner. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm great. Um, I have a question about the off days that kids will not yeah. be in school or at the part-time um, is iPal available to them or it, will that be like double dipping? Yeah, so, like so iPal on the days that they're not in school. Right. So on the rotational schedule, the days that they're not in school, they would actually have work or some kind of engagement from their classroom teacher to do on the days when they weren't in school. Um, and those are the pieces we need to figure out with teachers, like what's reasonable, how would that all work, how we make sure that teachers are accommodated to be able to do both the in-person and make sure kids have things to do in the distance learning. Um, and then the IPAL is completely separate. So parents will be enrolled and engaging in the program of delivery at their schools, or they would be um, engaging in IPAL. Um, and then, like I said, if we're in a rotation with at-home learning, that at-home learning component would be done in collaboration with the, the classroom teacher on the days that they're not in school. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, Melissa is next in line. Melissa. You get to see her face. I love it when someone's face comes up. Hi, Melissa. Go ahead, Melissa, your mic is open. Hmm. All right, we'll go down. Melissa, one last chance. We can always try to catch her again. That's true. Okay, um, DR, Dr. DR, either way. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Hi. <laughs> Not a doctor. <laughs> uh, my name's Darla. Hi. Hi, um, Darla. Thank, thank you guys for uh, having this forum. I really appreciate it. Um, I had some questions in the chat, but they're kind of getting buried. So um, just to give you a heads up that there'll be some redundancy with the chat but um, so my first question is just a short one is is delta going to be on the same um district planning system or setup right delta High so School? Whatever, what whatever approach that we're on in pasco delta will be on so if we're doing some kind of a rotation without home learning that's what they'll be doing so they'll be in the same okay uh, 
approach yet. And then I was curious if there has already, I, I'm sure there has been, I just, I guess I want to be assured, but of what kind of plans are in place if a, a staff member or a student is, is found to have coronavirus, how quickly are, is the district able to um, do any sort of contact tracing or communications with families to say, hey, don't send your kids to school tomorrow or whatever might be needed there? Right, no, it's a great question. And I wanna, um, we have a, a phenomenal risk manager named Aubrey Pitzer, who is an employee of ours, that that's her job is risk management. And she's been collaborating with the health department all through the spring and over the summer. And, um, you know, we've been navigating situations. And so we're practicing our protocol and refining it all the time around how we do identification, notification, contact tracing, and then communicating out. So we're already practicing that protocol. We're working in partnership with the Benton Franklin County Health Department. Um, so we feel confident that we'll have a protocol in place where we can be agile and responsive. We're already talking about each school having kind of an isolation room. So if someone is, you know, we think that they, you know, there's an issue, they go to an isolation room. So, and then, you know, we're so lucky because as a community, you've supported us with levies in the past that we have a school nurse at every site. So our school nurses will be a phenomenal support with that. Um, we, you know, have our, our counselor, we have a counselor at every school, at least one. So we'll have a, a team of people who can help with those pieces. And like I said, we're really, um, like, we're not waiting till the, the fall to come up with the protocol. Like we've been working on a protocol and practicing it since the spring over the summer. And every time we use it, and we've had to use it, um, we get a little better, we find a piece that didn't quite work and we tweak it. So we're practicing it while there's not as many people on campus um, so that when everyone's here that we're, we're practiced and ready to go. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, I, another question I had, if you don't mind, was um, the, during the IPAL survey, at, at, you, know, the, you were asked to like, decide which survey to complete. And then at the end of the survey, there was actually a, a sign up to register your student and it, it, it was, uh, I guess it was a little jarring because it felt like it was a survey to ask questions and then it ended with um, like a commitment. And so my question is really if kind of two part, one is, you know, I know, I know you've mentioned to contact the IPEL people, but um, it, is there going to be more back and forth with parents on, about IPEL or what we'd like to see? Um, and then the other question is, in order for the district to be able to launch into like a virtual, all virtual situation, do we all need to be registered for IPAL anyway? Will that be the, the virtual option? Well, there's a lot of questions all packed into there, sorry. <laughs> so first of all, the, the survey wasn't intended to be a commitment and so if it felt that way, we're sorry. Totally wasn't. Like you, if you signed up and you choose not to, that's totally fine. Um, they're, they're, Deb Thurston, again, is the contact person. She's working on looking at those surveys and then determining next steps for how the planning will work. And certainly community and parent voice is important in that. So, um, you know, when you ask, will there be more back and forth, uh, I would really defer to Deb on that. And I would encourage you to email Deb and ask um, what her plan is for engaging parents moving forward. She's hugely collaborative, super parent responsive, and, and wants to work in collaboration with parents. So I know that that would be important to her. Um, and then you asked me that, uh, oh, and there's Deb right there. Um, you asked if, um, if the IPAL is the virtual option. So let me clarify this. So if we're in on a rotation with at-home learning, that would be a school-based um, program and like whoever the teacher of record is would be navigating that with your student and, and the family. If you're not doing that and you wanna do IPAL, IPAL is completely separate. So you would not have to enroll in IPAL in order to get the support on the off rotation days. All of that would happen, the off rotation days and the at-home learning happens on site with the teacher of record or you're enrolled in IPAL. Okay, thank you for that clarification because I, I was still thinking about live streaming and Zoom options um, would be great for like for my person personally for my family that would be better than IPAL um, 
and I was confused that it sounded like that was IPEL was the only option. So I appreciate your clarification. And I'm done. I'm done grilling you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, no, it's okay. And I, I just, uh, I don't know if you can see your screen, but Deb Thurston is on the screen. Um, just so oh, you have oh, okay. a face that goes with the, the name. Um, and Deb, I don't know if you have a focus group coming up or if you have a plan for engaging families. I do have a focus group coming up. Um, and it's part of the instruction um, okay, group, great. but I would be happy to um, have you contact me and then I can get you connected to that and, okay. and yeah, answer so a little more of your questions. Thank you so, so much. So Darla, um, like I mentioned before, tomorrow there'll be a, a communication goes out to the community and it'll list all the focus groups. So the one you're looking for, it's called instruction. And then you can just sign up and say you want to be a part of that. And that's how you would get to, to um, collaborate with Deb over how IPAL looks. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you both. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for showing up, Deb. You just popped right on my screen, right in the perfect timing. <laughs> Shane invited me. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Um, we have Mike waiting to ask a question. Mike, go ahead. Hi, it's actually um, Karina, his wife, and I, wow. have, I have a few questions. I think a couple of them are really quick. My first question is, um, is IPAL the same as what the district was doing from March through the end of the school year? No. Has yeah. that totally failed my middle schooler? He, um, and I don't, I heard from a lot of parents that that was the same for them, but I don't think middle schoolers succeeded in that, um, whatever that was. But my next question is, um, if you do IPAL, is that supported through federal and state funds to the District of Pasco? All of, well, I mean, Fundamentally, our, our, our whole program is, I mean, our school is funded through state and federal dollars. So I think the answer is, is yes. Well, my, my question is like, if I went to outside, like if I did homeschool for my kids, but I didn't do IPAL, then Pasco School District wouldn't get money for my children, right? Which would leave Pasco School District at a disadvantage, I think. Um, so if we want Pasco School District to get the funding for our children, do we have to sign up for IPAL? So, um, you know, it's a tough question. Here, here, fundamentally, I want you to make the best decision for your, for your child. Um, and if that's homeschooling for you, then that's homeschooling for you. Funding does follow the student. So if you choose to homeschool, you're right. It does impact Pasco School District's funding. If you're in one of our schools getting instruction with one of our teachers, we receive funding for that. If you're in IPAL, we receive funding for that. Um, so you're right, the decisions that teachers or parents make about where their students are educated does impact our funding. Um, but again, fundamentally, I want you to make a decision that's best for you and your family. Okay, well, I love Pasco schools, so I want the best for Pasco schools. I have three children in it, one in the dual language, one with special needs, and one in middle school. So we're all over the spectrum here. But um, my third and final question, I hope, is, um, oh, now I lost it. Oh, um, right now, are there negotiations in process with the teachers' unions? Because I was told that the teachers' union was what was holding teachers back from teaching more, like these last three months. So are you guys negotiating with the unions right now to set up something for the fall? Because I just want it to succeed. I don't want to see it fail. So I know that we need to work with that as well. Yeah, so we work with our labor partners, all of our labor partners, whether it's teachers, bus drivers, paraprofessionals. Um, any change of working condition is a mandatory subject of bargain. So anytime any employee's workload changes substantially, uh, we bargain that in contract negotiations. Um, you know, I think we could all agree that the COVID circumstance that hit everyone changed everyone's working conditions significantly. 
So that happened in the spring and will happen again in the fall. So we'll be we'll be working in collaboration with our labor partners around that. Okay. That was my main question. Thank you so much for answering all these questions on here. I look forward to the frequently asked questions that you're sending out. Oh, I'm, I'm happy to do it. I worked on the ones from Monday night today. So I'll add these ones in and work on them tomorrow. Okay, um, Nikki is next in line. Nikki, go ahead and ask your question. Okay, hi, can you hear me? I can, hi Nikki. Oh good, hi. So I have a question, if you know about what the classroom rotation will look like in secondary versus elementary, because I've heard in elementary that um, specialists, specials is gonna be difficult because cleaning out an entire room before another classroom can go in. But obviously in secondary, kids are constantly changing with other students and going into a different classroom with the new group of students. Right, so um, the, the truth of it is, we're not sure about all those details until our teachers meet in those focus groups on the 13th through the 17th. And those are the kinds of details that we really rely on our experts that are closest to the work to, to let us know what they need. Um, and it, it needs to make sense. So the school, school day, not only your students coming maybe two days a week, um, that will be different, but even the school day might look slightly different. And so we just need to make some accommodations to um, allow for like, you know, rooms to be quote unquote turned over as one group of students is leaving and one group of students is coming. Um, so things will look different during the school day too. We just wanna try our very, very best to maintain predictability and, and routine for kids. We want students to show back up to their schools, it to be as similar as possible, recognizing that we're gonna wear face coverings and have to stand six feet apart from one another. Um, but we wanna to try to maintain those things that they know and love about school. And at the same time, recognize that we're gonna to have to do some things around you know, cleaning in between classes and so forth. So the, the answer to your question is we're just not sure yet, but we're definitely going to rely on our collaborators um, in those focus groups to help us understand what that needs to look like. Okay, great. Thank you. You bet. Okay, uh, Maria is next. Hi, Maria Lee. Hi, I just have a quick question for you. Sure. Um, has the district started purchasing PPEs for um, staff and students? We have. So the good news about that is real early on, um, we uh, as superintendents advocated statewide and um, we actually are a part of a consortium that's managed out of ESD, um, the Vancouver ESD. And so we were able to be in a consortium of multiple districts, which one ensured that we would have access because there were so many of us that the order for PPE was large. So people wanted to, to fill our order because it was uh, financially incentivizing for PPE companies. So um, one, it assured access, but because we were buying in such bulk, it also ensured that as districts we got quality pricing. Um, so that process is already underway, contracts are signed, um, and those things are already happening. And, and that's probably been off since end of July or so. So that was something we did right out of the gate. And so my second question uh, for you is, will you be having a community forum for your staff so that we can have, um, we can have say in the conversation besides just a survey? So every building principal had a voluntary staff meeting a week or so ago and offered opportunity um, the collaborator group invitations going out to all employees tomorrow as well for the focus groups. Um, so, so far, those are the option or the opportunities to participate. And then the collaborator groups that we did, the 250, um, you know, if there's a sense that we need to do broader touch for collaboration and communication, Maria, you know, I'm always willing to do that. So um, when we get done with this kind of layers of communication, if we feel like we need to do more, I'm, I'm certainly happy to do that. I just want to make sure that we are listening to what's um, realistic in the school ses uh, setting and what won't be realistic. 
Yeah, hundred percent. That's why uh, um, when the focus group links go out tomorrow, we I hope that people sign up and participate. Um, we need to hear your voice about what's reasonable, what what can we can make work, and and those of you who are closest to work know what that is. So look for those links so that um, we can get as many people participating as possible in those focus groups. And those of you who emailed me after last on Monday night's focus groups, um, I submitted your names to Jenny Richardson to get you connected to the focus groups, but I would go ahead and, and sign up again when you see the link, just, just to be safe. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, first I wanna say, Darla, I think I accidentally put your hand down. If you had another question, please raise your hand again. Um, yes, I do. <laughs> okay, then go ahead. Okay, sorry. Yeah, um, this one is more, uh, it was prompted by the woman who talked about middle school and, and feeling like it didn't really work out for her kids. But um, I've thought a lot about all the things that my kids have missed. Um, and it's everything from like science fair I wrote about in the chat. Um, but I know that there were like mandatory health um, health related topics in, in, in fifth grade. Um, but then also looking at like, I, I, have an, I had a middle schooler taking um, eighth grade geometry and, um, and advanced Spanish, for instance. And those two things become high school credit, but, but the, actual, the actual education piece of those was probably many, many steps below what it would have been in person. And that's no offense to anybody. It was a big scramble to try to even just make it work. Um, so my question is really, is there going to be any sort of remediation provided um, to students for, for some of these big things or to make sure that they actually understand what they've, what they've covered or were supposed to have covered or, or what was just entirely missed by some, because I know some teachers didn't reach out at all while others continued on. So I'm, I'm just, it, it's, it's a kind of a bigger question about kids going on to the next level, to the next grade, what are we gonna do to make sure there's not a massive gap there? Right, no, it's a great question. And that's actually something we've been working on even since the spring. Um, and there's been collaborations um, happening around, you know, taking a look at our scope and sequences and our, um, the core standards that were identified for each course and knowing that we were gonna have to modify, modify and adjust to make sure, um, that concepts that were missed are taught. So the good news about that is our teachers are really practiced every year at assessing where the kids are that they get um, on a yearly basis and, and filling gaps. And so while the COVID scenario has broadened the need for that because it's impacted you know, everyone across the state in the nation, you know, we do have mechanisms in our district already to identify gaps and to, um, to plan to fill those. So um, I know that work is already happening. Teachers are well aware, district staff is supporting it. And, um, you know, our teachers are skillful at identifying where kids are and making sure what they have, what they need to move forward. So there'll be a recognition of that. Okay, yeah, and I, I just wanna say, you know, I, it's not even on the teachers in my mind, it's more just the amount of time. Um, oh, I, I mean, if, 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 you know, uh, trying to make up four months of, of advanced Spanish <laughs> or four months of geometry um, yeah. and bring that on the teacher, that seems like a lot. Well, and that's part of the reason why as district staff, we're helping to take a look at those scope and sequences and what's typically required, for example, in a fourth grade year and saying, okay, of these typical fourth grade standards, you know, how do we get really clear about what's essential? And of course, we would all argue that all of it's essential, but in this moment, how can we modify the fourth grade expectations and recognition that there's going to need to be some, some time spent filling the gap of either what wasn't covered, what wasn't accessed, or what was lost over the summer, right? So, so there is a recognition in the planning that it, the fourth grade expectations cannot look exactly like the fourth grade expectations from last year. And, and those are tough conversations because we all believe deeply that every single one of those standards and essential learnings is critical and important. So there's gonna have to be some tough decisions made um, while also honoring 
a, a rigorous and um, relevant and engaging curriculum for kids. And, and that's the heavy lifting of teaching. And our teachers are phenomenal at it. And district staff is already supporting it. And we have um, teachers that, that work as in support roles that are supporting that work. So it's not going to be as easy as I make it sound. It's complicated and, and it's hard. And, and we all recognize that it's an impact. Um, but we didn't wait um, to, to be told by OSPI we needed to do that. We already started that work. Will there be some consideration in that for, you know, not necessarily at grade school or middle school levels, but at high school levels for, for grades? Um, you know, there, there were some students I know did, were completely out of contact. So I don't know, you know, if they, I don't know how, how grades kind of came out across the board. Um, and I, I'm just aware that in some, some schools I've, in the state, I've heard they just gave everybody's A's. Um, which in high school matters more obviously than peer-to-peer uh, <laughs> -peer in middle school but um, that kind of is there going to be any sort of review of that as well yeah so when we did our grading guidance we didn't we were not one of the school district that just chose to give everyone A's we did do a modified grading scale of A B C D um, or an incomplete so, and each of the grades were, there's a qualifier there. So like if a teacher sees it, they know, for example, a D means, you know, that there was little engagement, you know, or little progress, or I can't remember the words, but teachers will know on a transcript if there's a D, what that meant in the COVID environment. Um, so we were not one of the districts that just gave everyone A's or everyone a pass. Well, passes were allowed or disallowed. Um, so but we did award a grade and it's on a, a consistent chart that everyone used the same kind of qualifier. So an A meant the same for, for everyone. Um, so teachers will know when they see it, what that means um, for a kid's experience prior to them receiving the student. So if you're a, you know, English, uh, sophomore English, you can look back at the freshman English grade and by the grade kind of know, okay, this is what the student did during the COVID closure. And there's some consistency there. Yeah, and I, and I get that. I think that the problem with high school becomes that there's a point where consistency between schools is going to be important um, more than consistency within a school. You know what I mean? Oh, I, yeah. Con yeah. As In far as like um, a student getting an A automatically for the same, the same class. So it's going to be, it'll be interesting for our students when they are considering college bound sort of um, information. The, um, the transcripts statewide will have a COVID designation too, so that you know, like we all know right now that it was the seniors of last year and the, you know, that are impacted by COVID, but five years from now, you know, when the eighth grader is going to college, you know, it's easy for us to forget that, oh, that was the year that there was a COVID closure. So all of the transcripts statewide have a designation that will be similar so that colleges, when they get them, it'll be a trigger for them that this was the COVID environment. But I hear you about consistency and in a large system, it's, it's you know, difficult in, perfect circumstances and in the middle of a, a pandemic, you know, it, right. it, it's, but we definitely recognize the need. Yeah, I'm glad to know that about the transcript. I had not heard that, so that's good information. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Shane, this is giving me a little bit of anxiety that my chat says there's like a hundred plus questions. I'm hoping that people are getting what they need from the call. <laughs> There are a lot of questions, okay. um, but there's also a lot of comments. Okay, um, I just don't, I just want to make sure that, because it is 7.33, I want to be uh, mindful of that. We said we would end at 7.30. Right. I'm happy to stay around and continue to ask questions, but I also don't want anyone who's on the call to feel like they can't leave the call if they want to based on the time. Um, so please, if you right. feel like, like I committed to being here till 7.30, I'm going to leave the call. Please don't feel like you are obligated to stay. Um, you're more than welcome to stay, and I'm happy to stay on and answer questions out of the chat for people who didn't feel like they got what they needed from the call. So um, please, if you're on the call and you feel like you need to leave, don't, you won't hurt my feelings. We are definitely over time, except Susan and um, Susani have to stay. Um, <laughs> but uh, for those of you, again, I just don't want you to feel because we are going to run over time, but I want to make sure that if you have chat questions that did not get answered, that you get them answered. 
and that you feel like you got what you needed from the, the town hall meeting. So we're also going to use the questions in the chat that didn't get answered in the FAQ document that we'll be putting, putting on the website. Yeah, real quick before everyone hangs up, I do want to talk about next steps and then I'll go back to um, answering questions. So we have the we had the town hall meeting on the 29th. We had one last night in Spanish. We have this one. The focus groups that I've continued to refer to are on the 13th through the 17th. We'll be presenting the reopening plan to the board on the 28th and then requesting their approval on the 11th. Uh, a couple of things that are not on our next steps are the if you want to be involved in the focus groups, there'll be a communication tomorrow. There will be another parent survey on Monday. And should we need to do some additional collaboration with our teachers, I'm absolutely open to that should we need to do that. So with that, that ends our, our call together. And like I said, if you by time need to leave, please feel free to do that. If you'd like to stick around because your question wasn't answered and you'd like me to answer it on the call, I'm happy to. Like Shane said, we will be taking the questions that are in the chat that we did not cover and creating a frequently asked questions document for our website. So our goal is to make sure everyone got what they needed from tonight's call. So again, thank you everyone for being here and I am officially closing the call, but I'm happy to stand uh, or to stay and answer anyone's question that, that needs it. Um, Adams uh, is waiting in line. So we're gonna okay. allow Adams to ask a question. Um, I did have a question about, um, by the way, hi, this is Valerie. Hi, Valerie. <laughs> I had a, yes, it is. And thank all of you so very much for being so thoughtful. I had a question after talking to some parents about, um, so if we're still like in phase 1.5, they would like to do the blended learning, but they would like to wait for a little bit. So is there some flexibility with going straight homeschool or signing on to be back in school, but kind of waiting for a few weeks for the cases to go down in our area? Gosh, Valerie, that's a great question. I don't know that we've thought that one through, but we should add it to the list. I mean, if our intent is to, to, to um, create as much flexibility as possible, then it would make sense to give some flexibility, but we also need to be mindful of kind of rules and laws about enrollment. So I think we'll just have to balance that, but I, I, you know, we wanna be flexible for families so that they feel like they can come back um, so I'll add that one to the list. It's a good one. I'm glad that you brought it up. Susan's going to write it down for me. Well, thank you, Susan. And, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and yeah, some of it, it just, it just came up that, you know, some parents think homeschooling is going to look like what they were doing right now where I'm sending assignment sheets or whatever. So, which I don't have a problem doing at all. And also, is there, a plan for any kind of like how how are we going to staff if we have people who stay home but then in like October November say our cases go way down things are under control then want to send their kids back to school yeah that's a great question Valerie it's going to be complicated uh, you know it it's going to be you know there's going to be a lot of moving parts to accommodate for you know parents making different decisions about enrollment, you know, staff who need accommodations that can't do in person. And we're just going to need to be really flexible and really patient with one another. But again, we want to allow that flexibility for families to do what they need to do in terms of enrollment. It's going to be complicated. I just, I think we should be upfront about that and know that going into it. Okay. Thank you. That was my question. <laughs> They're good ones, Valerie. I wish I had better answers. And thank you for everything you do, all of you. All of you on there that I can see. <laughs> um, Mari has a question. Or she, we thought she had a question. I see I her. Do. Can, there can you go. Me? Yes. Okay. Hello. Um, trying to pick which room is the quietest, dogs or kids? Um, <laughs> Okay, so I also wanna say thank you because your transparency goes a long way with the community um, and just being willing to answer all these questions. Um, and it's with great like optimism, but also caution that I hope we are able to open schools and get back to um, seeing kids and whatnot. Um, 
But my concern is more of a parent, I guess, um, and a teacher. So both, but I think in, in wanting to um, trust teachers and also understand that going through a pandemic, you know, some people maybe didn't have the technology or the skills or et cetera to be able to facilitate online learning. Um, there were huge disparities in the kind of education the kids received. So you'd have teachers that, you know, called your house, put up signs, brought materials, um, did Zoom several times a week. Uh, and then you'd have teachers that emailed one time the entire time. Um, and I understand like with the union uh, wanting to protect us and whatnot, but as a parent, <laughs> that was really hard. Um, that was probably the hardest thing about the distance learning was just feeling like, um, you know, I had a, one of the students commented, I'm in middle school, so my teachers just don't care about me. Um, I just, I guess I don't know necessarily have a question, but more just input that I think we have to really put the kids first in this situation and, and however that needs to happen. So if somebody has a medical issue where they can't teach for whatever reason, or, you know, they don't have the ability, um, then maybe there's a sub, you know, I don't know. I don't have all the answers. <laughs> I just know that making it so that people didn't have to do stuff. And I'm trying to say this in the most politically correct po way possible, but it's really impossible. Um, wasn't helpful to kids. That's all. <laughs> well, I certainly appreciate you being here and I love your little emoji. It looks just like you. I would have recognized. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I guess I should say, I don't ever want to come across as negative, but you know, I'm a, I, I'm a problem, like I want problems to be solved and I want our district to be um, looked at as a wonderful, growing, professional district that it is. Um, and so in doing that, I think sometimes we have to identify problems and we have to say, yeah, this didn't work very well. Um, and so I just, I, I have family that teaches in other districts that had different requirements of them. And I was very frustrated by feeling like my hands were tied or like other people's hands were tied when I saw, you know, my relatives teaching in Moses Lake, you know, had to check email every day, you know, had to do PLCs. And, and I know that's unpopular opinion for me to say, like, make us do more work. <laughs> but really, if it's in the interest of the kids, um, some guidelines would be helpful. Well, I appreciate your comments. And you know, as you were talking it, one of your comments about, you know, people needing to know how um, yeah. made me think of wanting to highlight our relationship with Jeff Utech. We've had hundreds of our teachers take that training over the summer, and we are, as a district, looking to bring him um, in this fall. Uh, so there will be that support, too. You, you, when you brought up the know-how piece, it made me remember about that. I wanted to make sure to highlight it. Yes, and there's a lot of us that did that training this summer. And so, um, and I've reached out to my principal at the new school I'll be at, and if other people want help, like I think we really are a, an awesome community of teachers that wanna help each other. So just being able to um, access those resources and um, even just sharing the information from Jeff. Um, would I don't know how that's all gonna roll out before school starts, but. And again, I'm not criticizing how we handled a global pandemic because that's like unprecedented, right? So <laughs> I think everybody did their best, um, but it would be really nice before school to get like the core four and some of that other stuff um, really solid for people and move forward. So anyway, well, we, thanks for everything you guys do, all of you. Oh, thank you so much. Um, Mike. Oh, no, she just put her hand down. So never mind. <laughs> um, Melissa had raised her hand. Oh, she's back. Hi, Melissa. Hi. Hi. Sorry Hi. about that. Sorry about that earlier. Don't I be. haven't done Zoom on my phone yet, and I apparently had a setting that was off. No, so. You did great. You did great. We're glad you're here. Thank you so much for hosting this. Um, my question is about masks, um, particularly within the classroom, would they, is there any possibility of them not being required if there was social distancing or part partitions of some sort? And also I've heard people talk about face shields that they're gonna use that in replacement of masks. And I didn't think that that was 
allowed. So that's why I'm asking on these to see if those kind of things are yeah. in. So let, let me clarify, face shields are allowed for kids and now also allowed for adults. Initially, they weren't allowed for adults at all. Okay. They were always allowed for kids, um, but now they're okay. allowed for for kids and adults. So um, I feel like- To replace masks. And this is so weird, like in the global pandemic, like that felt like a win for me. Like, oh good, I could just, I, oh good, I could put a face shield, not a face mask. And it felt like uh -huh. a win. Um, <laughs> your question about the partitions is one I'm actually asking and I'm pushing on. Um, they have these, I don't, they're not plexiglass, but they're like a thick plastic. And they make mm -hmm. kind of like what I would call a little temporary study carol, um, you know, and they're kind of tall. So I've been asking anyone who will listen to me at the state level that if we had those for kids in the classroom and when they were sitting down, could they then take their face shield or mask off as long as they were in their little partitioned area? Mm -hmm. I've yet to get an answer on that, but I will continue to push on that, the recess question, three foot social distancing if we think that's safe. Now, what I know is that this guidance, like I learned from the spring, things evolve quickly. So, you know, where we are today will likely not be where we are in the fall. Um, so my hope is that some of those things are, are considered as long as, again, it creates safety for people. It doesn't undermine safety for people, um, mm -hmm. but it does provide some flexibility for kids. Great. Thanks so much. Yeah, no problem. Okay, well, that was all of the raised hands. If anybody else has a question, they can certainly raise their hand again. Uh, Maria has raised her hand, so go ahead, Maria. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, so um, I'm noticing like in um, grocery stores and stuff like that, they've already put that plexiglass up to protect um, people. Is that something that the district is considering for like our office um, personnel and our bus drivers? Yeah, our facilities folks have already been exploring that, researching pricing, looking at what we might need. Um, we'll, we'll dig in in the focus groups and, and make some final determinations, but those like researching all of that and knowing what our options are and, and having a plan for doing that is already underway. One of the things that we might also think about are kind of protocols for visiting schools. So for example, at Franklin, where you have the security vestibule where parents can come in, talk through the glass, maybe we have to um, change how access and only under very limited circumstances would parents come all the way into the school, but maybe they would stay there and, you know, we would, we would navigate that differently. So not only are we looking at those physical barriers or hygiene barriers or whatever they call, I call them sneeze guards, but that doesn't sound very appropriate, but the hygiene barriers, not only looking at that, but also looking at, do we need to change some protocol and practice? Like, you know, the guidance is talking about being very limited in who has access to buildings. So, you know, we're, we're probably not going to have lots of volunteers kind of in and out all of the time, at least in the beginning, until we have a really clear sense of how all of this is going to work. So um, those are all pieces that, that um, we've been exploring. So yes to the barriers, and we may need to change some of our access protocols to, to accommodate health and safety. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, Mike raised her, her hand again. I know your name's not Mike, and I apologize if I forgot what your name was, but uh, I, you can ask your question now if you'd like. Okay, sorry, it's Karina, but- um, That's right, Karina. I remembered <laughs> my question. Um, I actually asked it in the chat as well. Are we exploring the option of year-round education to kind of supplement kids only getting two days in school? We, I have to be honest with you, we're not right now. It doesn't mean that, you know, it couldn't be a conversation later on, um, but that has not been a conversation that we've had up to this point. Um, I think we're all focused on getting a model in place, getting reopened, getting all of the health and safety protocols in place. You know, if we wanted to explore something like that later on, um, or if it was to come up as part of the focus groups as an interest, um, we could definitely take a look at that. Um, but I, I will be honest that it has not come up to this point. Okay, um, then I guess I don't understand because I thought that there was a 180 day requirement for students to have school 
how do you guys meet the 180 days when kids are only in school for two? Yeah, oh. it's a great, yeah, that's a great question. Um, the, the, and, and, I, and, the, and OSPI is kind of working on the rules of that. But um, the, t the days that they would be at home learning, doing things um, conceivably could be counted. But um, it's, it's good to, it's an insightful question because it is one that OSPI and the uh, State Board of Education actually are working on the rules of that. Um, but that's, I think, how they'll do it is those days that students are at home learning would also be counted in some way toward the 180 days and the 1,027 hours. Okay, yeah. all right, thank you. Yes. Oh, unmute. Hello. Hi, I hi how are you? Are you? Yes, hi. hi. Um, I'm so glad you are having these. I really enjoy coming to them, and I like that they're online. Mm. Um, have a question and maybe some clarification on it. So I know I've heard from, and I, because I was at the school with lunches and whatnot, hearing from a lot of people and families that, the biggest fear that some of them feel is that us thinking, yeah, we'll go two days a week would be like an all year thing. Do you oh. think there is the possibility that maybe we start on a rotational schedule and then move into having everybody back at some point? You know what, Whitney, I'm glad you asked that. And I'm sorry that I didn't clarify that right at the beginning. And I should have. Our ultimate goal is to bring as many kids back for as much time as the health conditions and the state guidelines allow. So as soon as we can, we would want to transition back to more and more kids on campus, more and more of a normal and a traditional environment. So just because we start this way doesn't mean we'll end this way. Like as things continue to evolve for the better, we will continue then to, and you know, who knows, maybe we get going and even with six foot social distancing, we figure out that we can get more kids on campus. Then we can always make those modifications as we continue to move forward. So I appreciate you asking that, and I'm sorry to have not framed that differently from the beginning. But like I said, just because we start this way doesn't mean we finish this way. It's really about wanting to move along that continuum toward full face-to-face -face traditional instruction. Right, and I didn't want to give out like bad information. And when I had heard it a few times, and I kept thinking, well, no, we'll go back. Yeah, this is, this is temporary. We're all going to go back. Then you hear, you know, people are really concerned and then I started to think oh my gosh was I wrong I don't know <laughs> I also thought we were going back in April so I was wrong about that yeah so did I uh, <laughs> so, there was no one more surprised than me when we didn't go back in April like, right. what I had plans I had plans I did too. Uh, no that was my only question but again just major snaps and comment that I love that you have this. It's making it transparent. You're getting to as many people as possible, casting a net. And I, I know you can take all this feedback and make the best choices uh, for all of the families we serve. So thank you. Well, thank you, Whitney. It's been fun. Okay, Nana has been waiting patiently. Hi, Nana. Um, Adriana is my name. Ah. <laughs> Hi. Um, <laughs> I have a few questions. Um, the first, just um, the screenings. Um, who would be the ones, I guess, screening the students every day? Yes, yeah, so we have some options. options. We, we could either do it at school, and if we did it at school, it would be a team of people, you know, between you know paraprofessionals and school nurse, and there'd be have to be a team of people, um, or parents can do it at home. Um, there is going to be a public health group that works on that. Um, I, I have a, an opinion about that, but um, I work in collaboration with a team. So I'll defer to the team's recommendation. But so if it's here at school, it would be a team of Pasco school, school district employees, um, or it would be families at home doing those healthcare screenings. Okay. And then the second, um, as staff, um, just because um, I have a child uh, and he's in childcare. Um, and then when this whole pandemic started, there was a point where um, they even told us that we couldn't take our kid into childcare if they even had like a runny nose or 
um, they maybe started coughing um, and we would be required to go pick them up. So how would you handle situations where that is still required in the childcare and you have teachers teaching and maybe they get called in the middle of the day, you have to come pick up your kid. <laughs> how would you fill in staff, I guess, in that situation? Yeah. So we have a process for that now. Um, you know, teachers, we call in a sub, someone covers a class, teachers go take care of sick children. Um, I think what we need to be prepared for is that could happen more often. So we'll need right. to have a deep, a robust, you know, substitute pool and maybe think about some creative options for class coverage that also um, protects other teachers so that they can do what they need to do. Um, so I, I'm not, I'm not necessarily worried about building a protocol. We already have a protocol for that. I'm worried about having enough staff in case that is way more in number than we think or than it normally is. Um, so we'll have to, you know, work really hard with our substitute pool, make sure that we have plenty of different staff, have alternative plans, maybe, you know, staff that aren't currently attached to classes will have to fill in. I mean, we just can get really creative about that. Um, so it's a great question and something we've been thinking about. Because the other thing is, as staff, we're gonna be asked not to come to work when we're sick. And I know that there's many of us, and myself included, who I come to work sick because I think that that's what's expected of me because that's what it means to work hard. Well, I have to change my frame. That's not what it means to work hard. That means that's working silly and I need to take better care of myself. And so I cannot come to work sick. No one can, like we have to stay home. And so that could cause us to need more subs, et cetera. Um, so we just need to make sure that we're prepared for with that with a deep enough pool that we can cover. Okay. Thank you. That's yeah. Good. Brian has his hand raised. Hello. Just a quick question here. I, I put it in the chat a long time ago, but I, I was wondering how many people that we had participating in these over the last three days. I know that these are kind of hard to get to sometimes, and I was just wondering how many people showed up over the last three of these Zoom meetings. There so over the three days, I would say 200. We had about 125. Those are peak tonight. Um, about 130 on Monday, and then we had about 30 on Tuesday. So, well, probably closer to 250, almost 300. Awesome. Were you expecting a little bit more people to show up, or is this about what you guys were looking for? Well, we've never done this before, so honestly, I wasn't as sure what to expect at all. Um, so I, you know, I'm kind of pleasantly, I'm pleased, especially since it's the first time. And, and honestly, I've really appreciated it and enjoyed it. I've learned a lot and, you know, this could be something that we could continue even after, you know, post COVID, you know, having the flexibility as, as community, not to have to drive to the district office or go out of your house. You can be right at home, um, interfacing. Like I, I kind I kind of like it. So I think we should keep doing it. <laughs> well, I want to I want to say that this has been great. You've been awesome at uh, communicating all this information and I think that we all are in the same boat where you don't really realize what the infrastructure gives you until you have to use it and these types of opportunities are obviously something that we didn't look at maybe six months ago but I think that moving forward these are great capabilities that we should continue to use moving forward. Well, I appreciate that feedback and I'm, I'm glad you feel the same way. I was even thinking, you know, I've done community coffee events as a superintendent where I go sit at the Starbucks and people come and visit with me. I was even thinking about, you know, is there a way for me to do like a virtual office hour where like if you're working, you know, maybe not can't come to a coffee shop and sit with me, but maybe if you knew you could just pop on for 15 minutes with the superintendent during virtual office hours, um, you know, and that could be even post COVID. So um, I appreciate your feedback about that. And I'm, I'm really kind of excited about the, the possibility of being able to collaborate with people more deeply via um, virtual um, moving forward. Even, like I said, even once we could be face to face, you know, maybe this is something we can continue to do. So I'm kind of excited about exploring what other options could happen. Yep, appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Thanks for the comment. I appreciate that. Uh, that is it for hands raised. I was kind of scrolling through the chat to see if I could, but I'm not good at talking to you and looking at the chat and I. Right. I um, there has been, 
Um, there's some questions about the health screening and some concern about parents not being honest. Um, how will the district oversee that and make sure that they're taken seriously by the families? Uh, uh, one, to, uh, one person's fear is that a family will send a child to school who they know is sick because they don't have child care. Um, what, uh, do we have any insight into that? Well, I, I, you know, I'm going to be just, I'm going to kind of share my maybe naivety. I would expect that everyone is honest on a self a health screening where you have to attest that your child is not sick. I, it didn't occur to me that people wouldn't be honest. I mean, on, you know, honestly. Um, so, you know, the, the group that is going to review the health screening guidance is a group that has our school nurses in it and Aubrey Pitzer, who is our risk manager. Um, and I, have trusted their judgment implicitly, implicitly for my entire career. So I'll, I'll, I'll trust their judgment around the health screeners. Um, if we notice that a child is ill once they get to school, we can always intervene then. Um, certainly it would be better for that to happen through the health screening at home. Um, but we'll just have to kind of, I'm gonna to defer to the experts in that health screening group around the screeners and what the best protocol and practice is for that. I think they're um, great questions. And, and there are things to, I think they're right things to be concerned about. Uh, Megan has raised her hand. Uh, Megan, go ahead. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Hi there, Hi. yes. Hi. I have a question um, about symptoms and sending kids to school. It seems like just about every school year, you know, kids and staff and everybody gets sick with something but sometimes those symptoms can linger for a very long time, even if kids aren't contagious. You know, they get a cough that lasts a couple weeks or something like that, um, but their pediatrician has said they're not contagious and fine to go back to school. Um, but in the day of, of COVID, what does that look like? Because I'm just thinking of, you know, staff who have a lingering cough, can they not come back for a couple weeks or kids or, do you know what I'm saying? I do, I do. And the health guidelines, and I, I'm, gonna, I'm embarrassed to tell you that I can't remember them off the top of my head, but the health guidelines are pretty clear. Like if you've been sick, then, you know, like after, and I don't know if it's, if you have to be fever free for so many days or once the last symptom, you know, and so many days after that, but the health, the guidance from the health department is very clear about what your responsibility is someone who's been ill before you return. So we would just be following um, those health guidelines. Okay. Yeah. And I'm sorry, I can't remember off the top of my head what they are, but they're, and like for us, so every day that I come into the booth building, like tonight, I came down to the booth building. So I had to fill out the health screener and I had to verify that, no, I didn't have a fever. No, I don't have cough. No, I don't have any aches or pains. You know, no, I don't have whatever. And if I clicked yes, then it would um, pop up a screen and would tell me what to do to go to the doctor. And, and then it would, it would tell me exactly, like, don't come back to work until X, Y, and Z has happened. So all of that information is there. Um, and I would anticipate that our health screeners for families would be similar um, so that parents had that information right at hand and they knew exactly how to kind of navigate the illness before they sent their students back to school. Yeah, I'm just anticipating if kids have those lingering symptoms that they've had in the past, a little bit of a runny nose or a little bit of a, a cough left over. Sometimes those things linger, um, but they're not contagious that our kids yeah. will end up missing a lot more school yeah. this year than, and staff also missing work and what that looks like, because you could potentially run out of sick leave much quicker than yeah. um, in years past. Mm -hmm. No, those are all great questions, and I think they're details that we're going to need to work out together in collaboration with the health department and our school nurses and staff. Um, so I, I'm confident that before school starts, you're going to get better answers than the one I just gave you. <laughs> <laughs> get it worked out, and we'll get it communicated to you. Thank you, and thank you for yeah. hosting these. They've been great. Oh, it's my pleasure. So that was the last uh, raised hand, and it is 8.03. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, so out of respect to my fellow uh, district office staff and my board member colleague, who I promised would be done at 7.30, I should probably formally close the call.
but I will um, offer um, Jenny Richardson's email. My email is mwhitney at psd1.org. Please feel free to email me with any questions that you have that didn't get answered. Watch for information to be involved in focus groups, and we're just so grateful that you were here. Thank you so much.